Hello, it's Reverend Chris Taylor on the fifth Sunday after Trinity. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Romans 8, 1 to 11 and Matthew 13, 1 to 9 and 18 to 23. The Romans reading is interesting and the Matthew reading is the parable of the sower as told by Jesus and its exposition as revealed by Jesus. So here we go with the readings. But before we do, um, I think I'm going to pray the collect for today, the fifth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit and kindle in all who minister the gospel your countless gifts of grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Romans 8, 1 to 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the spirit, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord according to St Matthew. Chapter 13, verses 1 to 9 and 18 to 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path. And the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they didn't have much soil. They sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose they were scorched and since they had no root they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on rocky ground. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the, world, the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
Good old St Paul, eh? I'm just going to turn back to that reading from Romans. Um, and I think we need to think about what it actually means to set our minds on things of the flesh. I wonder if um, St Paul for a moment thought that uh, this would be used as a stick to beat anybody who had fleshly thoughts um, and thought about fornication um, or even just straightforward sex. There's far more to the flesh than sex and we need to recognise that. Um, the flesh is where we all dwell. We all have longings for things, for possessions, for ease, for comfort, for good food, for nice wine, um, for whatever it is. These are all things of the flesh. The urge to go shopping, the urge to own and possess stuff. This is the flesh. And it isn't just about sex. It's about all the things that flesh is heir to, to quote from William Shakespeare. So that's the first thing. It's far broader. It's about living in the world but not being distracted from the work of the Spirit, from the work that the Spirit calls us to. It's about inviting the Spirit into our lives, inviting God in God's Spirit's form into our lives to guide us, lead us, prompt us, enable us, ennoble us. All those wonderful words that sometimes we just let go and go, I want to go shopping. And that's the wonderful thing about God because, as we'll find out in a few minutes, this is a God of 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 20th, 30th, 70th, 70 times 7 chances opportunities to dwell in the Spirit and to bear fruit in the Spirit. And I think Paul is quite unhelpful here when he talks about those who dwell in the flesh are hostile to God. Because I, I dwell in the flesh periodically. I try hard not to, but I do. But at any time that I'm dwelling in the flesh, I'm not hostile to God. I love God. I love God's word. I love Jesus' life and example. I'm lost in awe of Jesus' sacrifice. And I'm always conscious of that. But I know that I'm also a great one for lovely paintings and nice wine and occasional good food with friends. And that is dwelling in the flesh. But that's who I am. I'm a human being. I'm made of flesh. So I would suggest to you that in that context, when Paul says, um, for those who dwell in the flesh are hostile to God. And actually, when you look, he doesn't really say that. He says the mind that is set on the flesh. And that reminds me a bit of the rich young man where Jesus looks into his eyes and sees into his heart and knows that he's obsessed with his wealth and possessions. His mind is set on his wealth and possessions, as well as trying to do all the things that the Torah led him to do. And Jesus sees all this, but he knows that he's distracted by his wealth, by his position. And Jesus sees him and loves him and tells him what to do, because his mind is set on the flesh. It isn't just occasionally distracted by the, does that make sense? Yeah, he isn't occasionally distracted by the things of the world, as we all are, or many of us anyway. I can't speak for you, I can speak for me. Um, anyway, that's what I think St Paul is saying. We mustn't be set on the flesh. We are, you know, um, subject to the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, um, Shakespeare. But actually... If our minds are caught up in the beauty and wonder of God, um, those will just be distractions every now and then, rather than something that we're completely set on. Anyway, enough of St Paul. Let's go and have a look at St Matthew. I love the parable of the sower. There's so much in it. Um, there's so much that we could talk about. 
what I'm, I mean, I, I have a whole new parable from one of my friends uh, who talks about the parable of the church service on Facebook um, and all the same things that happen or have happened with people who have been tuning in who don't regularly tune in or arrive or turn up to church services. This is happening online and people are falling away. People dip in and dip out without being touched at all by it. Or so we believe, we'll come to that in a bit, that's the birds and the rocky ground. And then you get those who turn up for one or two, they're so enthusiastic, and then they run out of steam. And then you've got the ones that have been with us all the way through lockdown, but as lockdown is beginning to ease, so they're choked by all their other stuff that goes on, football for the kids, shopping on a Sunday, whatever it is that they're going to see the family, which is a good thing. But you can go and see the family in the afternoon or whenever, I guess. So they're distracted by the weeds that grow up around them. And then you've got a few that have turned up to the services and got involved in church life and in the online life as well and are engaging with the vicar and with other folk um, in, in various social media areas and are beginning to become part of the body of the church, which is great. Um, but that's, an, that's another telling of the parable of the sower um, by my friend Fiona, which I really liked. The other thing that, that she suggested, which really struck me, was that actually when you do a Facebook service, there's teamwork involved. There's someone who does the tech. There's someone who organises the readers and the, the intercessors. There's someone who looks at the music maybe and chops the music in to the tech. And then there's the vicar or, or the curate or whoever it is that leads the service. So there's a team. And again, in the parable of the sower, that fertile ground didn't just happen. It may well be that it's a team, uh, a team enterprise where there are several fields where one farmer uh, ploughs. Um, one, one farmer prepares the ground, another farmer makes it even better, and then the third, the sower, comes along and sows. And eventually, you're going to have to harvest as well, harvest that fruit. So there's a team of three or four people involved indirectly in the parable that Jesus tells as well. Or there could be. I like that idea of a team working together. But for me, the parable of the sower has, well, it has various different um, things that recommend it to me. The first one is the fact that the picture that Jesus uses, the metaphor that Jesus uses for the seed on rocky ground which has no hope, it's picked up by birds and they've flown away. Well how many of you have got gardens where birds come and do their business and there in the middle of them sometimes you get the most beautiful unexpected plant. I'm not talking about weeds, I mean weeds blow in, blow out, birds produce whatever and you've got weeds in there. But you might get the most glorious poppy or the most what, what the most lovely unexpected lupin or, or whatever. And they are great joys, I think, when, when the and, and that's when, um, despite the best efforts of uh, of people to ignore the word of God and the word of the kingdom, it springs up in them almost unexpectedly and uninvitedly, but it makes a difference. It doesn't happen all the time. But it's an occasional thing, and I think it's absolutely brilliant when that happens. So the first thing is unexpectedly bearing fruit when you never knew that the seed was actually sown by a bird somewhere other than when you... Yeah, anyway, it's a good one. Um, the other thing that really strikes me about this parable is how it is about forgiveness and second chances. Sowing goes on right the way through the year, as does harvesting. Different crops, different occasions. Maybe that same sower goes out every day for four or five weeks sowing different, um, different fields and different areas. That activity of sowing the word of God, sowing the seeds, isn't just a one-off. It happens lots and lots throughout the year, year in, year out, month in, month out. A bit like church services, a bit like this online stuff. And you never know who's going to hear you. You never know who's going to be listening. You never know when you're in the shop talking to another Christian friend or someone who asks you why you're smiling and you say, well, I've got a new start today. God's on my side. God's, God's got my back. Um, I'm, I'm, whatever it is, 
uh, that makes you happy on a Monday when everyone else is a bit grim. That's sowing the seed of God. That's sowing the seeds of the kingdom and the knowledge of God and of the love of his son Jesus for us. So, and that happens all the time, which means that there may be a day when you as a card-carrying, committed church member, an active Christian, just doesn't want to know. You hear the word, it goes in one ear, it goes out the other. I've heard it before. I'm much more worried about prices at, at Tesco, or I'm much more worried about my elderly aunt, or my mum, my dad, my son, my daughter, my grandchildren. There's all these other things that, as in the parable of the sower, crowd in. It's what St Paul was saying. It's that nature of being human, of being in the flesh. It's when our minds are utterly set on the flesh that it's wrong. Well, not wrong, but it's it's less less able for the seed of the seed of the word to take root in you. But when it's just a, a distraction, when it's something that is a genuine human concern for the well-being of someone you care for, or whatever it is, we are by nature distractible. Jesus understands that. Which is why when you go behind these parables that he tells, behind these stories that he tells, there's so much more to them than what there appears to be on the surface. So do not despair if one week you just didn't hear the word of God. Do not despair if you've gone and you've spoken to friends about your faith and nothing seems to have happened. It will in due course. Our job is to plant the seeds. We're not going to be helping them to take root we prepare the ground we make sure the soil is as fertile as we can do and sometimes we might miss the mark completely just like the sower in Jesus's story that doesn't mean we stop trying and then there are other times when we too are less fruitful let's say than we would want to be um, and again we have the fresh opportunity tomorrow the next day the next day to bear fruit so this is one of the most optimistic and encouraging parables that Jesus tells. And dwell in it. Have a look at it. See if it says anything else to you as well. Enjoy it. God bless you. Amen.